Well, good morning. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of James, and if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one under the seats nearby, and James is on page 111 in those uh, Bibles, and I do encourage you to open up a copy of God's Word. We usually um, practice what's called expositional expository preaching, so we take a section of Scripture, and the goal is to let the main point of this text be the main point of this sermon. Uh, So my job's not to use the Bible to say something that I would like to say, uh, but for us all together, myself included, to submit ourselves under God's Word, and we do this by taking a portion of God's Word and listening carefully and closely to it because we believe this is God's very Word and it's living and active, and the Holy Spirit acts miracles in our hearts and minds and lives as we do this. So let's uh, pray expectantly as we turn to God's Word. Our Father, we come recognizing that uh, we do not have the source of wisdom within us, uh, but you are the source of wisdom. You are the only God of wisdom. And so we receive this from you. We believe your word is infinitely wise because it's an expression of your very mind. And so we pray that you would work these miracles in our hearts and minds. Give us the wisdom we need so our lives may be transformed and whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are continuing this sermon series in James. James is a brief and punchy and practical letter. It's called the Proverbs of the New Testament because it gives us the wisdom we need to live well in God's world. So James wrote to address a number of problems in the lives of the Christians he was writing to, And underneath all the problems, we can see that he's identifying one root issue, and that's that their hearts and their lives are divided, and we're not very different. Many of our problems come from this issue underneath all the other issues, divided hearts and divided lives. So he addresses how we have divided minds, so sometimes we're of a mind to trust God, and other times we don't. He addresses our devout loyalties. We're committed to God. And yet sometimes half-hearted or not committed to him, drifting into worldliness. He challenges our divided relationships that are filled with conflicts or avoidance. And those divided relationships are there because of our divided hearts where we have passions and desires at war within us. He also addresses how we divide things that belong together, like faith and works and rich and poor. And so James' goal is to heal our divided lives so that we can be made undivided and whole. We can be wholeheartedly and sincerely devoted to Jesus. The way we get there is by receiving what James refers to as the wisdom from above. So James is giving us the wisdom of above, which is the wisdom of Jesus. He's the source of wisdom. Jesus lived the perfectly undivided life of wisdom and wholeness, and His wisdom can heal us. So this book is applying the wisdom of Jesus to the problems and the practicalities of our lives. So let's read James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18 for this morning. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted... I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and He Himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, heavenly lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of His own will, He has brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of His creatures. Well, last week we saw that James opens this letter by calling us to receive the wisdom that rejoices in trials. This morning, this theme of trials continues, but now it also includes the topic of temptation. 
James calls Christians to remain steadfast in trials and temptation. So the question in this text is this, how can you and I endure a life filled with trials and temptations? This isn't just an abstract question or topic for this morning. This is one of the most challenging parts of your life and of my life. And certainly, life as a Christian, how can you keep trusting God when life is hard? How will you stand firm in temptation? You and I have faced temptations this week. Some of you had victory over some temptation that you've fallen into into sin before. Others of you had a massive failure yet again. And you're here this morning either kind of forgetting about it, blocking it off, and you've tended to do that over time. Just move on, forget about it, life goes better because I can't handle the, the guilt, don't know how to handle this. Or you're just here with an overwhelming sense of failure. Others of you had somewhere in between, maybe a mix. So we receive the forgiveness and grace of Jesus because of his death on the cross, which we've talked about this morning. But now, how do we endure temptation when it comes? What do we do this afternoon, tomorrow morning, Wednesday? So you will face temptation this week to lust or to lie or to lie about a sin that someone is addressing in your life. You'll have a temptation to give in to greed or gluttony or grumbling. How do you resist? How do you stand firm? We need to know three realities to endure trials and temptations, according to this text. We need to know a blessing, a danger, and a gift. The blessing of the crown of life, the danger of indwelling sin, and the gift of the new birth. So let's walk through this text as we consider these three realities. So first, we need to know the blessing of the crown of life. When you are going through suffering and you're just barely holding on to Jesus, you may not feel blessed as you're holding your grip on him, but James says you are. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man, man or woman, blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. So if you've been engaged with the Bible for a number of years, this may sound familiar. What other text begins, blessed is the man who? And we just read it this morning, Psalm 1. The truly blessed are those who can endure life's trials and temptations like a tree that is firmly planted, stable and steadfast and able to bear fruit. This is probably not an actual physical crown that... James is referring to, this is the blessing that's given to someone who holds fast, you receive a crown of life. This crown of life is probably a metaphor taken from the ancient athletic games. So this is a wreath-like crown that was given to those who would win in some kind of a competition. This image is used a lot in the New Testament. So Paul talks about the Christian life as training for an athletic game, and he says we do it to receive an imperishable crown rather than the perishable crown that's received in earthly competitions. He also referred to a crown of righteousness that the Lord gives to all who love Christ, so all Christians will receive a crown of righteousness one day. Peter refers to elders of churches receiving an unfading crown of glory. Jesus said in Revelation 2 that those who endure suffering will receive the crown of life. So this is probably not a collection of physical crowns that you're going to stack on one another or have a few or keep on a shelf or something. This is an image often used to encourage Christians to hold fast. It's viewed as a reward or a result of enduring the trials and temptations of life with faith. So the crown is a metaphor for eternal life, the crown of life, and it's the expectation for all Christians. Now, this could sound like a theological problem. How is James promising the crown of life, eternal life, as a result of endurance? Doesn't that make eternal life something that we earn 
So I want to take a few moments to address this. It could sound like James is saying that the crown of life is something that we earn. He's not. Enduring trials to the end is how we show that we're real Christians. It's what all Christians must do and what all Christians will do. And this is because the God who brings you to the faith keeps you in the faith. It's because all those who truly trust Jesus also immediately begin to love Jesus. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. So if you trust Jesus, you love Jesus, you obey Jesus, you endure to the end. So the Christian life is viewed as a race that we start and finish, and we're in between, and we must, and we will, finish and receive the crown of life. Now, if we don't get this, this vision of the Christian life, then we'll misunderstand what James is promising here. So, for example, I disagree that crowns are a special reward for some select Christians. That would assume that only some Christians endure to the end. But Jesus and Paul and Peter and James all teach that Christians must endure to the end, and they will endure to the end because God ensures that they do. God brings us to the faith, and He keeps us in the faith. All true Christians will endure to the end by God's power to receive the crown of life. And James is pronouncing this as a blessing to encourage you to keep going. And notice that James says the crown of life is for those then that have two things true of them. Do you see this? It's for those who remain steadfast under trial. And second, notice that crown's given to all who love Christ. Those are the same people. There are not some Christians who start believing, give up, don't love Jesus, and then other Christians who keep believing and love Jesus. No, this is a way of referring to Christians. True Christians are those who trust Christ, and out of that trust, they love Him, and out of that love, they remain steadfast under trial by God's power, and then they receive the crown of life. So the crown of life is not a special reward for some super Christians who endure. No, it's, it's not making uh, eternal life something that we earn. This is not some kind of like workspace system now. This is promised to all who run the race of faith. So this is part of the encouragement that God intends for you to have in mind to endure your trials and temptations this week. So that's the blessing, the blessing of the crown of life given to those who stand firm. But this is not an easy task. The race of faith is filled with dangers and perils. James addresses a primary peril in the midst of trials, the danger of indwelling sin, meaning the sin that dwells within us even as Christians. So this is verses 13 to 15. This is about temptation, and this is the primary danger in the midst of trials. Every trial will present itself with temptation. So when you're in a trial, a health concern or a job concern or a financial concern, your main challenge there, the main thing you should be praying for is not first to get out of that trial, but first to hold fast in the temptations that come in the midst of those trials. So the temptation is there in every trial. Tempted to despair. We're tempted to get angry. Tempted to self-medicate with alcohol or overeating or something else. And life's filled with many other temptations. James addresses our tendency here to blame something outside of ourselves for our temptations. So we can blame our circumstances or we can blame Satan. We can blame someone else. James focuses on how we can even blame God. Look at verse 13. No one, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So James is picturing uh, you or I, someone in a trial who's tempted with sin, and then they blame God for it. So James pictures someone saying, okay, God's bringing this trial into my life, right? Good theology. God is sovereign over our trials. He allows everything that happens or causes everything that happens for purposes. And now I'm tempted to sin. So if I do, isn't that God's fault? He allowed this temptation to come into my life. And James says, no, you can't blame God. You are responsible for your own desires and actions 
Just because God brings you into a trial doesn't mean He is to blame for your sin in the midst of it. So one way to understand this is to recognize that there's a difference between objects outside of us and desires within us when we think about temptation. So for example, if I found myself on an empty street with a new McLaren parked on that street with the door open, the keys are in the ignition, or it's probably a push start actually, my guess, haven't actually been in one. Um, No one's around. That is an object presented to me. But I am then responsible for my own desire. If I covet that car and then I steal it, I'm to blame. I can't say, this is God's fault because He sovereignly orchestrated a circumstance where I was all alone on an empty street with a McLaren with the door open and it's ready to go. Temptation to sin is sourced in our own hearts. And then James describes the process of how temptation works in verses 14 and 15. Now, the English Puritan John Owen wrote a whole book on these verses. That's often how these 1600s uh, Puritan pastors and authors would do it, right? They'd take one or two verses, and then they just wring them out um, and, so, and dwell on these. And so, his book on these verses is called Indwelling Sin. Indwelling Sin, referring to this sin that still dwells within us, even as believers. James is showing us how sin and temptation works in our lives. There's a progression of five stages that John Owen helps us walk through in these verses to see that when this progression happens, how we can understand it. So, do you ever wonder why you keep doing the things that you do that you don't want to do? Do you ever wonder how you can learn to make progress in the fight of sin and temptation? You have to understand how temptation works. It's not a completely mysterious thing. James describes it here in verses 14 and 15. Let's read it together. But each person is tempted when? And so each person, so this is you, this is me, this past week, this coming week. This is what's happening when we fall into sin. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So here's the progression for how temptation works. James describes sin as though it's part of a process of an adulterous relationship that creates a child. And here are the five stages of temptation. It begins when sin lures us. Owen says that this initial step is focused on our minds. So we're lured or we're drawn away, it's the language of this uh, word here, dragged away, drawn away from what we should be thinking about. Our minds are drawn away from depending on God or delighting in Him. We begin to think, this would be just a little sin, no big deal. There's always forgiveness, right? We've all experienced this, it's common to everyone, and this is the beginning. So, Learn to identify those thoughts when you start to have them because that's the beginning of the tragedy that's coming. Let the alarm begin to go off in your mind when you have these thoughts that are luring you away and dragging you away from what you should be thinking about. You're being lured onto a dangerous path. The second stage is enticement. This now aims for our affections. We now start to desire the sin. We're open to it. We're deceived into thinking maybe it will be worth it. We begin to forget about the consequences. You experience that? All all the consequences that you've thought about before, that you thought you were prepared, they just disappear in the moment. And then we forget about the damage that this could do to others, the, the hurt that will inflict on someone else the offense of it to God. The next step is the conception of sin. So this now moves from the mind and the heart to the will. We're now choosing to do this. We always do what we want to do. Our will is always involved in sin. And now that we want to sin, we're consenting to do it. Then this leads to the fourth step, which is birth. This is the act of sin. This is where we actually carry it out with our mind and heart. There's more an active action here, lust, for instance, anger, or with our words, 
or with our actions. James calls this the birth of sin. Sin was conceived in the heart, and then it gives birth in action. And then the last stage is death. James is using the metaphor of the creation of human life to describe sin. It starts with luring and enticing, and then sin is conceived, and then it gives birth, and then it grows up into death and dies. And James is saying, you may think of sin as only the moment when you actually commit that sinful action. Like, I sinned. And then you may think, okay, I mean, it was just like, a, it was like three seconds, not a big deal. And James is saying, hold on. There's a whole process involved here. There's a whole life cycle of sin. You need to rewind and figure out what was happening in your mind, your heart, and your will before you did that and see where this leads you. You need to realize where it comes from. It's rooted in your mind, in your heart, in your will. You are lured and enticed by your own thoughts. Your will, your, your heart gave consent to do this. Even if it happened in a split second, that's going on in you. And it might happen so quickly because you've trained yourself to do this because the process used to be longer and you gave in and you gave in and you gave in and so it's just got slick runways to happen immediately in your own heart and life. Helping us see this, sin in its full context, is helpful for us to then be able to fight this. Sin is not just a standalone action completely detached from your deepest thoughts, desires, and will. And this is why we can't make excuses for our sins. Blaming something outside of ourselves. Think about the ways we tend to do this. There may be times when we want to blame God for temptations to sin. I've heard many people get upset, upset with God after they sinned, where they make a mess of their lives, a direct result of their own sin, and then they blame God and say, why did God let this stuff happen to me? Or we blame our circumstances. But those circumstances didn't force you to sin. It was your own fallen mind and heart and will that engaged with those circumstances to act in this way. You may want to say, the devil made me do it. Yes, the devil may be actively seeking to get you to sin, but Satan's temptations can only work if you consent if your desire goes along with it, you have to take the bait. Your desires go after what he wants you to do. If you sin, it was rooted in your own mind, affections, and will. And back to the circumstances uh, option of blaming. In our culture, we may, many blame circumstances so that people don't have to take responsibility. We are, has anyone noticed, we are in a hyper-empathetic culture right now. Now, some people lack empathy and that's a big problem. And some people are reacting to our hyper-empathetic culture with no empathy, which makes us want to be hyper-empathetic. So we got to be careful here. But let's just recognize that this is happening. And because of this, we can say that some people who are murderers or thieves or rioters should get a pass because they're victims of their own circumstances or upbringing or lack of privileges. And it is important to recognize, and it's often been neglected, that past circumstances often do contribute to factors that lead people to give in to temptation to sin. And we should recognize that. Context creates unique temptations and opportunities to sin, and some people have more of them. But whatever amount of truth there is in that, I just want to focus on what James is focusing on here, which is this does not remove personal responsibility. Another way we tend to remove responsibility is by making excuses for our own desires. In this case, we may recognize that the desire, the actions actually do come from our own desires. They do come from our own hearts, but then we excuse our desires and view them as neutral or even good. So people refer to illicit sexual desires as needs, addicted to online images, or they have an affair and say, I had needs that weren't being met. Or some say, I was born this way, and I don't want to deny that we are born with various desires and inclinations. But that doesn't make all desires and inclinations good. Just because we have deep inclinations doesn't mean that God approves of them. So the point of verses 13 to 15 is for you and I to take responsibility for temptation. 
And in order to do this, we have to understand ourselves. We have to learn our minds, our hearts, our wills, and how they're engaged even before we sin. So very practically, you may have a particular besetting sin. That's how Christians have referred to sins that just keep showing up, deep patterns in our lives. I would encourage you to identify that sin and then pay attention to the circumstances and situations that usually give rise to that. And then look inside and think what was going on in your mind, in your affections, and with your will that was leading you to do that. This was so helpful in my own life in learning to identify and fight and kill a certain sin in in my life. Just learning what are the circumstances, what's the pattern in my life, and therefore in those circumstances, how, how am I prone to be deceptive in my thinking and lured away and enticed and giving consent to this? What's leading to those actions? That can help you learn to fight far earlier in the process. And one of the best things that can come from recognizing this is this. If the battle starts in your mind and your heart, then that's where you can focus your attention on learning to fight sin and prevent it from growing. So how do we do this? Well, there's a lot of things, but I love the things that John Owen said in his book, Indwelling Sin. He said that we need to fill our minds and hearts with Christ and the gospel. So here's what he said. If the heart be filled with the cross of Christ... It casts death and undesirableness upon them all sins. It leaves no seeming beauty, no appearing pleasure or comeliness in them. So you see what he's saying? If if your heart and mind are filled with affection for the desire of Jesus and his grace, then that actually makes sin look unappealing in comparison. So he says, fill your affections with the cross of Christ that there may be no room for sin. Just fill your heart with Christ and it pushes out sin. This is why one of the most practical things we can do in the battle of temptation is to just focus our minds on Christ, even when we're not tempted. It's why when a sermon is full of Christ and your heart is being filled with Him, even if there is not much at all by way of concrete practical application, it is still deeply practical because it is pushing out the capacities in your heart for sin to fill. It's why when we engage in daily Bible reading, we don't just want to get content barely considered, but we want to see Jesus. The more we're filled up with Christ, the less room for sin there is. Or as Thomas Chalmers put it, he uh, loved and and read John Owen's book as well, another uh, brother from hundreds of years ago, in 1600s, he referred to the expulsive power of a new affection. So if you want to get rid of an affection for sin, this root of it in your own heart, then you have to get a new, greater desire in your heart, and that will push out the old, lesser desires. So love for Christ, when it gets in our heart, pushes out, it expels, it has an expulsive power in it. It it pushes out the desire for sin. And this leads to the question, how then can this happen and get to work in our lives? How can we endure trials and temptations? Well, we've seen the blessing and the danger, and now we see the gift. Verses 16 to 18 show us the gift of the new birth. James just said that evil comes from us. Now he says that goodness comes from God. Sin comes from the inside. Every good gift comes from above, and there's one gift in particular that matters most to us in trials and temptations, and that's the new birth. James says in verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to to change. So this is who God is. This is what He does. He's the source of all that's good. Every good we have is from Him. And then in verse 18, notice the greatest gift, of His own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You know, one of the curiosities of the book of James is how he seems to only focus, at least at first, on what we do. He has this reputation for being atheological. And at 
first, it looks like he doesn't say hardly anything about God's grace and salvation. But while he does emphasize practical living, he he does also mention God's grace and salvation, just not in how we may expect it. This is an example. Notice how James refers to God and how he brought us forth by the word of truth. This bringing forth is James's way of referring to what the New Testament elsewhere refers to as the new birth, what Jesus referred to as being born again, what Paul referred to as being made alive with Christ or being made, made a new creation, what theologians refer to as regeneration. It's the gift of a new heart. James gives us a mini theology of the new birth here, and he shows why it matters for temptations. So notice first he shows us the source of the new birth. He says it's of God's own will that he brought us forth. So God desired to do this. God of his own will causes you to be born again. If you're a Christian, this has happened to you. You have a new life. You have a new heart. In, internally, mind, heart, desires, there's a transformation that's happened. Second, he shows the means of the new birth, and it's by the word of truth. So that's the gospel, the message of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection for us and our salvation. God uses the gospel message when you hear it, when you read it, uh, when you remember it. He uses that word by the Spirit's power to cause you to be born again. So that's the expulsive power of a new affection planted in your heart, starting to grow here. And then third, we see the purpose of the new birth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. So God causes us to be born again so that we'd be like the beginning of a harvest, the first fruits of a harvest, bearing fruit in the world, resisting temptation. This language of first fruits of His creatures, that's new creation language in the New Testament. So, a new creation's coming, a world of beauty and perfection, no more sin or temptation or evil desire. That's coming, and the first fruits has started. He's already causing people to be born again with this transformation happening. It's a sign that the rest of the harvest is coming. So, James is saying, how can you remain steadfast in trials and temptations? One answer is this, God gives you every good gift, especially the new birth. So you don't have to be hopeless in trials and temptation. Don't think that sin is inevitable. No, of course, you will not be perfect in this life. There will be times when you fail. Yes, you'll still sin, but that does not mean that in any given situation, you must sin. If God has brought you forth by the word of truth, then you can fight You can resist. You can say no. You have a new desire planted in your heart for Christ, which pushes out these desires for sin. And we look forward to the crown of life. So, let's just consider in the last moment here, the one whom you're trusting, the one that we set our affection on for this new power. Think about Jesus in light of this text. He is the truly blessed one who endured trials and temptations, the only one who did it perfectly, tempted in every way as we are, and yet his mind and his heart were never lured away with sinful desire. He never gave consent to sin. He never let it give birth in his life. And why did he do it? Because you and I have failed, and we deserve for our sin to not only give birth in our lives, but we deserve, because we've done that, for it to lead to eternal death. And he took that death upon himself, though he did not deserve it, so you and I can receive the crown of life with him. So how do we endure trials and temptations this week? How do we become the blessed one who stands firm and receives the crown of life? By holding fast to Jesus. By not blaming our situation, by not blaming God, but understanding how this is rooted in our mind, our heart, our will, and by embracing then the hope of the new birth, the grace of the new birth, the gift of the new birth that gives us a new ability and capacity to say no. So in order to remain steadfast and firm in trials and temptation, you have to know three realities. The blessing of the crown of life that's coming. The danger of indwelling sin that is still within you and the powerful gift of the new birth that has been planted within you if you are in Christ. And if you are not in Christ, trust Him and receive this. Let's pray.
Our Father, we recognize that we have been considering here a serious matter, and we're thinking about the, some of the greatest powers in the world, which are even within our own hearts, the most serious future ends of eternal life or death, the very real battles we face. And so we pray that you would have abundant, overflowing grace and mercy on us. We pray that we would have hope kindled in our heart for the crown of life. We pray that we would have honest self-awareness of where sin comes from in our hearts. And we pray that you would increasingly fill our hearts and minds with your beauty in Jesus by the Spirit so that the desire for sin would be pushed out. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.